Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. Outgoing government senator Timothy Mangal says his departure from the Senate was an amicable decision arrived at by him and the UWP administration. He says that while he transitions into private life and away from the realm of elective politics, he remains a fervent supporter of the current government and wishes the incoming senator and political candidate well. Timothy Mangal has had an interesting ride when it comes to his political career. He emerged first as a candidate for the then ruling St. Lucia Labour Party for the Castries Southeast seat in the 2011 election. He was defeated by Guy Joseph and later declared that he was disillusioned by the SLP's neglect of the Castries Southeast seat. In 2016, he made an appearance on a UWP platform and announced that he was switching his allegiance. He was appointed the chairman of the National Housing Corporation, NHC, in 2016 by the UWP administration. In 2017, he was named senator, replacing Jimmy Henry, who was dogged by scandal. On Friday, the 18th of September, 2020, a government press statement informed that Timothy Mangal would be replaced in the Senate by Angelina Fer Polius. Mangal insists that there is no bad blood between him and the administration. Well, basically, as you know, um, lovely, we are heading into an election season, and you would realize that both parties are making the necessary preparations for elections. Now, I will not be a candidate in the upcoming elections. So, um, we have five senators there three of whom are ministers, cannot be replaced because of the fact that they are ministers. It left myself and Mr. Jean-Pierre. Mr. Jean-Pierre will be a candidate for the United Workers' Party in Labry. So quite rightly, um, the government would love to bring in its candidates to give exposure, and I, and I support that very much, the idea of Ms. Farah Polius representing the United Workers' Party in the next elections for Den Reno. It is quite fitting for her to get the necessary exposure and i felt that it was necessary since um she would be coming into the senate that it was an amicable agreement between myself and the government that i would make way to allow mrs polios to come in into the senate to get the necessary exposure ahead of the next general elections according to mangal all is well between him and the government and he is looking forward to helping the uwp secure an election victory nothing really changes for me it just allows me a little bit more time to spend in to my private business and to reflect um, especially in this um, tough economic times you know you require a lot more personal attention um, in doing so and also I must also add that of course I'm looking forward to the next general elections and I'm looking forward to pay my part to supporting my party supporting the UWP to ensure that they are returned to office come the next general elections whenever that is called. I served for a period of three years, and I must say I enjoyed serving. Um, it's something that I like to do. Um, I had a very good working relationship with all the members of the Senate, both the government, the opposition, and the independent senators. Um, I think that, um, you know, it's always a privilege to serve, especially at the legislative level. and. Um, Certainly, I believe that I did make my contribution to the best of my ability. Um, the whole idea of debate, I, I did enjoy, and I did enjoy um, um, pushing forward the government's agenda. Mangal has wished Polius well, as she is set to assume her place in the Senate, becoming the sixth female to do so. With the income support program and extended layoff period both concluding at the end of the month of September, Minister for Tourism Dominic Fady says there may be tough times ahead for hotel workers who are employed at resorts that are yet to reopen. The minister says although the government continues to actively work with hotels to ensure that there is support for staff, further redundancies are a likelihood. Shaka Wooding has more. Although several hotels have reopened, welcoming both employees and visitors back to properties around the island, Tourism Minister Dominic Fede reminds that the situation facing thousands of hotel employees is still critical. Minister Fede says as closed hotels struggle to meet monthly payments to banks and insurance companies, it is unlikely that some will be prepared to resume operations anytime soon. 
The minister worries that this could spell disaster for hotel employees, who at the end of September will no longer benefit from the economic relief program. We have done our best from the NIC standpoint to go to Parliament. We amended the NIC Act and allow um, individuals to get unemployment benefits for six months. This comes to an end at the end of uh, September. It becomes uh, really tough now because with those payments coming to an end, um, a lot of people are not going to have jobs and are not going to have those payments from the NIC. So that worsens the situation. Although in early 2020, the government moved to extend the legal layoff period from 12 to 24 weeks. Fede noted that many hotels began layoffs in April. Therefore, this too will end on September 30th. He says although this could lead to redundancies and corresponding pay in some cases, the financial situation at some hotels may not allow for immediate or timely payments for people to fall back on. It really is not enough. A lot of hotels... They have no indication as to when they are going to be open. Having a hotel that is shut and having financial obligations such as insurance and also to pay the bank is extremely difficult uh, for a number of business, uh, businesses, especially small businesses. And, and so being caught in the middle of all of this inertia that we see now in tourism of hotels that are mostly closed our employees. He says this is why the government of St. Lucia remains committed to reviving the economy. He believes that if things remain on the current trajectory, better days will come soon. We are motivated to do everything possible to work hard to get our economy back up on track and to as well continue the good work we've started in opening the initial phases of the uh, general economy but as well phase one in tourism. And now it is the final leg, I believe, is to uh, consolidate the successes we've had with opening so far. The minister disclosed that since the reopening of the tourism sector on July 9, 2020, the industry has regained 20% of its previous capacity. Jaco Wooding, Hot 7 News. Civil engineer and political and social commentator John Peters believes that the issue of development within the PME ought not to be politicized. Peters came to the defense of both administrations who played a role in the unfolding situation, noting that all their known interventions have been well within the law. Following confirmation of developments taking place at the base of Gopitor, well within the Pitor management area, blame has been ascribed to both sides of the political divide, as members of the public cast their judgment to what little information is currently available in the public domain. However, local commentator John Peters believes that the issue is becoming a political football, when neither party should really be blamed. Peters believes that in all known instances, the ministers at the time acted well within the law and the jurisdiction of their ministries. The Minister of Finance is not authorized by law to determine land use. He has no authority under the law to determine whether you should build or not build in a particular area of land. And therefore, when, the, when then Kenny, Dr. Kenny Anthony wrote that letter, that letter was correct to the letter of the law. He was absolutely correct in indicating that, it's, that, that there are conditions. He was absolutely correct in not going further and giving approval to development because he had no such power. And that matter is therefore closed as far as I'm concerned in terms of legality and good behavior as a government minister. He says this defense can also be extended to the current prime minister, who despite popular belief, does not hold the authority to determine land use amongst other things. Remember, these are private lands, all right? And therefore, my understanding of the act and my reading of the act also says that the minister of finance, the prime minister, or the minister of physical development, all three, have no authority to give approval on any land space. So the, the other part of the, the discussion which centered upon uh, our present prime minister giving approval, that is incorrect, that is impossible. Peters believes that the true issue lies within the environmental impacts assessment, which would have been submitted to the DCA for approval. He has called for its release to the public. If a development is taking place in such sensitive environmental areas, then it requires an environmental impact assessment. And therefore, the DCA then has to come to the fore and to 
confirm, and I think it is right that they make that public, what was stated in the environmental impact assessment, two, what measures they took to ensure that what was in that report was in fact implemented by the developer, because where the collapse may have been is in relation to how the monitoring was done in terms of what was happening on the site. Peters believes that such issues of national relevance ought to be addressed objectively. Jaco Winning, Hot 7 News. This is the Hot 7 TV Nightly News. Stay with us. There's more after the break.